Hello, this is Kenneth Camp, and I'm excited about bringing this presentation, Trauma-Informed Care, to you today. This is directed towards those who work with children in a ministry or classroom setting, and you are looking for ways to know how to interact with children when they are really having a difficult time or some challenges or some issues that keep coming up. So we're going to dive into that and at least point you, in, hopefully, in a direction that will uh, help you understand maybe why they are having some of these challenges and point you in the direction of some getting some more information. I have given this presentation a couple of times um, in person or live with groups of either teachers and or volunteers that work with children in these settings and we've got some very good feedback. So I wanted to make this available in this format at least on my website here kennethacamp.com and please access it, and uh, hopefully you'll find some use out of it, and I, I trust that you will. Feel free to uh, pass it on or share it with others if you feel like it is beneficial. And also, if, um, if you're in a position where you would like for me or someone else uh, with this background to come and give this presentation live, along with a 12-minute video clip that's not included here in this presentation, please contact me here via the website. In that 12-minute video clip um, that I mentioned, it talks about uh, brain chemistry and what experts have learned over the last decade or so about how uh, brain chemistry is formed, how neurotransmitters affect the way that we act and, and, and respond to stimuli in our environment, and specifically how trauma affects the formation of our brain and the brain chemistry. So it's a very uh, informative video clip. We will touch on a couple of attributes from that, that clip here in just a moment. But I do want to point you toward three individuals who are on that, that video. One is Dr. Karen Purvis, who co-authored the book, The Connected Child. Excellent book. Uh, my wife, Danielle, and I uh, reference this book often. And I've read through it probably multiple times from cover to cover. You can find a lot of her other resources online easily by putting in her name or that book, and you'll find video clips and articles, etc. The other two, Dr. Dan Siegel and Dr. T uh, Tina Bryson, who co-authored the book Whole Brain Child, another book I highly recommend that we have utilized as well in the same manner, and you can find a lot of their resources online too. So I'd encourage you to, to uh, do some research on your own. Maybe after we talk here on this presentation, it'll pique your interest to do so. A little bit of our own personal history, so you understand why uh, my passion for this topic is about five years ago, we decided, my wife and I, to um, look into fostering to adopt. And so we became licensed as foster parents um, January of 2011. We had our first placement. Um, in June of 2011, an eight-month little boy, and then we ended up adopting him about 15 months later. And here we are on, on the adoption day when we adopted our, at the time, not quite two-year-old son, and I love this photo. Uh, me on the far right, my wife holding our now almost four-and-a-half-year-old son, and uh, the judge, obviously, on the, on the far left. And it was a uh, very exciting day, lots of emotions, many friends and family there, and uh, in the foster and adoption world we call this our gotcha day. That's when we, uh, our son became a part of our family. So we have, you know, it, way before even we began uh, or even were licensed as foster parents, we uh, knew that we had a lot to learn. So we began reading and attending conferences, etc., and then, of course, we have the, the personal experience of now almost four years of fostering and then adopting this little guy. And then we be, uh, came across some curriculum that's called Empower to Connect, which is based on Dr. Karen Purvis's principles, as well as this presentation. And we've gone through that course a couple of times and are now trainers for it. And so we um, also work with families um, who have children that come from a hard place, as Dr. Karen Purvis um, calls it. So we're going to cover three different objectives today as we jump into the material. One is just to understand simply how trauma 
and risk factors affect the brain. As I was referring to earlier, just the brain chemistry, et cetera, that we have learned through experts over the last 10, 15 years specifically has helped us to understand that better. Two is to learn how the uh, empowering, connecting, and correcting model of trauma-informed care is useful for all children in a ministry or classroom setting. What I mean is that no matter, you don't have to have two sets of, of approaches or strategies with your children. And then three, we're just going to talk through some practical interventions along with some empowering, connecting, and correcting strategies. Why do I believe that this training is needed? It's really pretty simple. Usually parents can choose from a wide, or even care, you know, child care providers, uh, such as volunteers and teachers, can choose from a wide variety of parenting styles uh, to help a child feel love and trust and, and to help them mature in their ability to reason and make judgments and, and to regulate their, their emotions. And that child will most likely respond well to any of these parenting um, strategies or practices. And it gives the parent a wide window of opportunity to build that connection with that child while they are correcting or disciplining them. But for parents or for classroom settings where you have children that, that come from a trauma background, they've experienced trauma, that window narrows and many of these traditional techniques simply don't work. And in fact, some of the time-tested traditional techniques can make it even more difficult in parenting or caring for tra traumatized children. And it could even make it more traumatizing for them. So I want to give you just a, a brief overview of what you would capture on that video clip or what you can find easily online, but just um, an understanding of two basic parts of the brain. There's many parts of the brain that we're not going to cover, but one is this executive part of the brain that you see here in the slide. It controls reason and logic and language, the ability to interpret cues or the ability to regulate your body. It's a, This part of the brain does not fully uh, develop until well into your 20s, especially for men, and um, so that explains why sometimes your teenagers are still acting like they're three or four years old. Um, but this is a very important part. So when the child is born, this, this part of the brain is not developed much at all. So we're going to talk some more about why that's important to understand. Now there's another uh, major part of the brain that's what we're going to call here the survival part of the brain. And that's what controls, as you see in the slide, our fight, flight, or freeze reflex. So when there's some kind of stimuli in the environment that causes an emotional response, um, this part of our brain kicks in. And we're either going to fight, or we're going to run away, or we're just going to stand there with our eyes wide open. And the thing is, is that for most of us, um, this, well, first of all, this is fully developed pretty much when a child is born. And so even things that have happened to that child when they were in the womb, they experienced it with this part of their brain. And for most of us, the executive part of the brain, especially as we grow older, helps keep the lid on the lower part of the brain or the survival part of the brain. But kids who have gone through trauma commonly experience a lid flipping response to situations that really doesn't make a whole lot of sense to us. But let me give you a fun little example. Let's say sometime in your past, you were chased down by a dog and it bit you on the leg and you had to have stitches. That's a traumatic event. And understandably, you would have an emotional response to that. And so let's say one day you're walking down the sidewalk and you look up and you see a dog walking towards you. Immediately, most likely, this part of your brain is going to kick in. You don't know if you should go kick the dog or if you should run the other way or if you're just going to freeze. But then... For most of us, the executive part of your brain kicks in, and you realize that there's a leash on the dog, and that there's a man holding the other end of the leash, and the dog only weighs about four pounds. And so then you begin your reason, and your logic starts kicking in, and you're able to calm the emotions in your body down and regulate yourself. That's what a healthy brain is able to do. But a child that comes from a, tra a trauma traumatic background gets stuck in that emotional or survival part of their brain. Let's talk about six risk factors that also is discussed briefly on that video clip and it, uh, Dr. Karen Purvis talks a lot about. You can find a lot of her information online about this. Um, 
but these are very common. One is prenatal stress. As I mentioned a while ago, a, a, a baby who's still in the womb of their mother uh, can feel that stress, and that affects the neurotransmitters and the brain chemistry. Um, you know, think of a mom who's maybe not uh, married and the stress that would be there, or a young couple who have fi has financial or marital stress um, in their, their relationship. That has an effect, a traumatic effect. If there's a difficult labor or birth, um, that can have a traumatic effect and will on that child. Early medical trauma, NICU, maybe the baby is born uh, premature and needs to spend a few days in a NICU environment, or there's multiple surgeries or painful experiences in their early life. And of course, uh, abuse, whether it's physical or sexual or verbal abuse, uh, especially in those first few years of, of a child's life, neglect, where they're just not even noticed, um, or even ignored, or then just traumatic events. Uh, it could be, you know, uh, hurricanes. It could be moving multiple times, etc. in a child's early life. As you can see, though, any child can be at risk for trauma-related behaviors. It doesn't have to be a child that comes from a foster background or adoption background. It can be any child, especially those first three on that list. And even our lifestyles, the way that we live life today, can cause trauma in a young child's life. The fast pace, the uh, uh, both parents working a lot, uh, the high rate of divorce, all these things can lead to uh, trauma in a child's life. You know, what this material addresses specifically, uh, while it does specifically address the challenges and needs of traumatized children, it emphasizes healthy connection and trust. So it's applicable to, again, to all children, even adults. The question is, how do we fix this when a child comes from a hard place like that? And one of the common threads in all children who have experienced trauma is that, when is that when their brains needed another brain, a healthy person, to help them understand what was going on, the outside event or experience, there was no one there. Either uh, there was just simply no one there or they couldn't be there. Maybe if they were in NICU, for example, or in, in a, uh, the hospital, and someone couldn't be right there. The fact is, what we've learned is that our brains uh, do not develop on their own. We need that interaction. We need that holding and that nurturing. We're not born with all that we need, again, that executive part of our brain. But in fact, our brains require that connection and relationship with others in order for us uh, to mature. So that makes it vital to, to understand this very important priority, and that is connecting with a child. 80% of handling difficult behavior is connecting with that child before the correction is needed. You think about a, a mother, especially, and how much nurturing a healthy mom does with that child after it's born, now, even before they're born, right? And so that is very, very important to re be re uh, reminded of. If you don't have a relationship, you don't have trust with that child, then you won't get very far with them. So ask these questions of yourself. Have you connected with the child before an issue arises? Are you connecting with them in a playful way and, and use an appropriate degree of correction to keep them on track? Do they know you care and love them? Do they interpret your actions and words as love? Our son, I've noticed here recently, will intentionally look at my face and look at my eyes and he's looking for those nonverbal cues to see if I'm listening, to see if I love him, to see if I care for him. And he's also very verbal so he will ask me, Daddy, do you still adore me? Do you, you know, love me? Um, and those things are so very, very important. And as he feels that nurture and that connection, then when it's time to correct, it's much, much easier. So let's think about um, your classroom settings or the environments that you have. And so here's three common challenges. I know there's many more, but one is the time frame, just how long your events are or how long your, your classes are. Stimulating environments that we have today, and then just flat out disrespect or disobedience. And we're going to look at all three of these and some practical uh, strategies. Time frame. Look at this poor guy. He looks wiped out. You know, a lot of times when uh, parents come to pick up 
their child or children from our uh, classes or, or uh, ministry settings. This is how they, they look. Um, and a lot of times it's because a lot of our programs or, or classes go right up to a, a feeding time, like lunch specifically. And so our children simply could be hungry and tired, and their behavior begins to go down. Children with, a trauma, with trauma are extremely sensitive to physiological stressors and needs. And so simply ask yourself the question, are the children I'm working with hungry or tired? Or tired? Is there something I can do physiologically that can help them through those last 20 minutes specifically uh, before their parents pick them up? So here's a few practical things that, that we can uh, apply in our, our classroom settings. One is making sure that they have a protein snack. I know a lot of snacks um, that are um, doled out in, in classrooms and, and maybe on Sunday morning, Sunday school times are high in carbohydrates, and those don't last very long. Um, so a lot of times what they need is a protein snack that will, that will help them tide over. If the church can't provide one, ask the parents to send one with their child. We began doing that a few months ago with our son as we were noticing on Sunday mornings, it would be 12, 15 or so when we'd pick him up, and he was having a very hard time transitioning from leaving there to, to going on to, to lunch, whatever. And so we began sending a protein snack that, that he can uh, have if he needs that. The other thing is just simply hydration. Water lowers glutamate, which is a neurotransmitter in our brains. It, it lowers those levels. Glutamate contributes to aggressive and excitability uh, behaviors. So simply just water your kids. Um, a lot of times we have them outside running around and inside running around, and, and uh, we forget to, uh, to give them some more water. And then also just think through um, uh, the, the timeline of your, of your day or of your class. And you may just need to uh, rearrange some activities so that they can help your children be physiologically prepared for when their parents come to pick them up. Uh, stimulating environments. You know, we have um, really created some exciting programs at our churches and in our preschools. And we can put on some exciting programs for them. Music and dancing, lights on the stage, fun games, funny skits. It really raises the... Uh, excitability of our children, and then it can make it difficult to transition to something that where we need for them to calm down and be still or be ready um, for the uh, parents to pick them up. Um, that environment challenges any child, right? Um, but for a child that uh, relies on their lower brain, remember that survival mode of the brain to function, um, they get very easily stuck in that, that um, part of their brain when they're in a stimulating environment. So you may want to just ask your, yourself that question. Is that what's going on here? Is the environment affecting the child? Or are the transitions uh, between activities very difficult for my child or these ch children? So here are a few practical things we can try if this is the case. One is um, give a child with noise sensitivity some earphones or earplugs. Or maybe let them choose where they want to sit or stand in a room if there's a, a lot of uh, loud music or lights or um, you know, just a lot of excitement in the room. A lot of times children with trauma um, will have some sensory challenges. And so that might be the case. It's just too, too much um, sensory input for that child at that moment. Uh, if the child is having difficulty regulating or calming their body down, uh, from being very excited to a transition to a setting where you want them to be more calm, then give them something heavy to carry. Uh, maybe a backpack or a stack of books, as you see on the slide there, um, as, that they can carry from one activity to another or to the next room that you're going to. You, know, you think about yourself, um, I'm sure you know, some or many of you um, have gone to get a massage and how that relaxes you. You may be very stressed and you think, I need a massage. You know, well, there, there's a physiological reason for that. The pressure or the, the weight of someone rubbing on, your, on your, your muscles helps your body and your brain to relax and to calm down. So you can do some things like that here with your child. Even, you know, pushing against a wall will help a child to do that. And I know a lot of you do this next one, but just uh, provide predictability or a heads up about transitions. 
you know, as you give a five minute warning, saying, you know, this is what we're about to do, you may need to allow a child who has difficulty with that to be able to make that announcement. You know, a bit of control for a child goes a long way. But remember, they're not in control. You're the one who's sharing your control. And then you may just need to help them calm their bodies in some playful ways, play some you know, fun little games that will help them calm down. And I know with your creativity as teachers and volunteers, that's something that uh, you can do well. And then the last one we'll talk about here is um, disrespect or disobedience. Yes, even at church that happens, right? Uh, sometimes, especially at church, a child looks right at you and point blank says no to your request or something that you're asking them to do. Or they may do just like this guy here is doing, you know, just totally disrespect you and, and stick their tongue out at you. Or they hear a rule and they look left and right and then do exactly the opposite of what they're supposed to do. Um, but you know, doesn't God give, uh, isn't that a God-given desire for us to, to you know, ex extract justice from that child when that happens? Well, uh, the thing is, is that as we're learning here, that's not going to probably be what's going to work with, with that child or any child. So let's look at some practical strategies. The goal here, again, is to help that child to move from that emotional part of their brain to the executive part of the brain, where they can uh, understand the, the cues, the relational cues, and the ability to regulate their body. And so I would start out, you know, trying to map, you know, at the lowest level, you know, for an ideal response. And... Just simply use some playful words to help them move from that emotional or survival mode of their brain to that more logical part of the brain. And you can do it by saying something along the lines of this. Hey, buddy, can you say that again with some respect? And just the playfulness of your voice and, and asking them a question may be all it takes to help them move from that, that you know, where we want them to help be able to regulate their bodies and respond to us. Uh, but if a child uh, demands something, saying something like, you know, uh, give me that you know, toy or whatever it might be, again, that playful response is something along the lines like this. Hey, buddy, are you asking or telling? Can you say that again with respect? And it may take some coaching to use some good words like that, but that's okay. I mean, the more you do this, the, the better they will respond in the future. We've seen that very uh, much with our son over time uh, that a lot of times that's all it takes is to use some words like that and he will um, quickly change the way that he interacts with us but there's times when you know a child will become very angry throws a tantrum refuses to participate they're rolling around on the floor and you know simply you may just need to change the whole subject for a few moments so get on their level to talk to them encourage them to to use good words and if it's just too much, then, you know, start thinking through what are some things that we can talk about that would totally get his mind off this subject. And again, the whole objective is if you get them talking, then they will uh, be, when they're talking to you, even if it's on a different subject, you know that you're moving them successfully from the survival part of the brain to the executive part of the brain. And as you are in a good place of communication, then you can bring it back around to what the request was or the activity that they uh, should be working on. And perhaps using slightly different wording uh, can help them transition to that. Um, you could give them some options even. Would you like to work on this alone or sit in my lap to work on this um, as an example of that? You know, all these interventions work well, uh, I want to re uh, reemphasize, with any child. It doesn't matter if they've dealt with trauma or not. And so uh, when you're working in a classroom setting or a ministry setting, don't, please don't feel like you have to have two sets of strategies. I would encourage you to learn more about these empowering and connecting and correcting strategies that, are, are, uh, that we've been talking about here and applying them to your whole class. You know, along those lines, and uh, I know that's a funny uh, slide there. I'm sure you got some questions and uh, we'll talk a little bit about some questions you may have um, but to continue on that last thought is that uh, traumatized children need to have someone that can come alongside them uh, that has a healthy 
uh, outlook on life, a healthy brain that has learned how to regulate their own self, to interact with people in a, in a uh, healthy way. And we all need that. And it's with compassion and grace that we provide this. And that's exactly the same fabric of who God is and how he interacts with us. I think we all agree with that. But um, as I'm wrapping up here, if you have some questions, you, you may have some something like, like these. Um, for example, what challenges or behaviors that you may be facing in your own class that we didn't touch on that you'd like some feedback on? It, um, please, um, you know, leave some comments in the uh, comment section here and we can have some dialogue about that and others can uh, chime in. Um, but there may be some things that uh, you may need to understand more clearly about. And one is, as we learn more about how our brain functions, uh, reward systems may not work well with our children from hard places or consequences at times may not work. And so just understanding why um, that is. And also, um, how could the interventions or strategies that we've been talking about here, uh, some of you may be thinking, well, these seem to be a little soft on children. Um, too soft or connection would cause our children not to grow, might be what you're thinking, you know, if we're too easy on them. But too much correction would cause our children not to trust. And so what we're really looking this for here is to strike a balance to where we are building trust, we're building connection, um, but then as we do that, as we nurture them, then we are empowering, we're learning how to empower them to make those corrections on their own and us come alongside when we need to, to help them correct their behavior. So feel free to ask questions in the, in the comment section below. Um, if I don't have the, the answers, which I, I know I won't have to all of them, hopefully there'll be other uh, readers who will chime in or I can point you to some other resources. And here's some uh, website links, um, mostly on Empower to Connect, um, that, that you can uh, look at to get a little bit more understanding of some of the things we've been talking about. I also uh, blog from time to time on, on this subject, so you can uh, go to my, since you're right here on my website, you can um, either look at the tag cloud and, and look at some of the, uh, the topics that relate to this, or look under the um, category Orphan Care and you'll find some uh, blogs that I've written, written or even some video, embedded videos about some of these topics. And to close, to wrap up this, again, I want to remind you that if you would like for me to make this presentation available at your church or your preschool or wherever, uh, just simply contact me here via my website. Thank you and have a blessed day.